Plutarch's Moralia and Ethical Essays, translated by Arthur Richard Schiletto. On Restraining Anger and the Passions Thereof, a dialogue between Scylla and Fundanus. Those painters, Fundanus, seem to me to do well, who, before giving the finishing touches to their paintings, lay them by for a time and then revise them because by taking their eyes off of them for a time, they gain by frequent inspection a new insight, and are more apt to detect minute differences that continue this familiarity would have hidden. Now, since a human being cannot so separate himself from himself for a time, and make a break in his continuity, and then approach himself again, and that is perhaps the chief reason why a man is a worse judge of himself than of other characters. The next best thing will be for a man to inspect his friends after an interval, and likewise offer himself to their scrutiny, not to see whether he has aged quickly, or whether his bodily condition is better or worse, but to examine his moral character, and see whether time has added any good quality, or removed any bad one. On my return, then, to Rome after an absence of two years, and having been away with you for five months, I will not at all be surprised that there has been a great increase of growth in those good points which you formerly had owing to your admirable nature. And when I see how gentle and obedient to reason your former excessive impiety and hot temper has become, it cannot but occur to me to quote the line, Ye gods, how much more mild has he become. And this mildness has not wrought in you sloth or weakness, but like the cultivation of soil it has produced smoothness and depth, fit for action, instead of the former, impetuosity and vehemence. And so it is clear that your propensity to anger has not been effaced by any declining vigour or through some chance, but has been cured by good precepts. And indeed, for I will tell you the truth, when our friend Eros reported this change in you to me, I suspected that owing to good will, he bear witness, not of the actual state of the case, but of what was becoming to all good and virtuous men. Although, as you know, he can never be persuaded to depart from his real opinion, to integrate himself with anyone. But now he is acquitted of false witness, and do you, as your journey gives you leisure, narrate to me the mode of cure that you employed to make your temper so under control, so natural and gentle and obedient to reason? My most friendly Scylla, take care that you do not in your goodwill and affection to me rest under any misconception of my real condition. For it is possible that Eros, not being able to always himself keep his temper in place in the obedience that Homer speaks of, but sometimes carried away by his hatred of what is bad, may think me grown milder than I really am, as in changes of the scale and music of the lowest notes when they become the highest. Neither of these is the case. Fundanus, but I oblige you to do as I ask. One of the excellent precepts, then, of Musonius that I remember, Scylla, is this, that those who wish to be well should diet themselves all life long. For I do not think that we must employ reason as a cure, as we do a hellebore, by purging it out with disease. But we must retain it in the soul, to restrain and govern the judgment. For the power of reason is not like a physic but wholesome food, which cooperates with good health in producing a good habit of the body in those by whom it is taken. But admonition and reproof, when passion is at its height and swelling, does little to no good, but resembles very closely those strong-smelling substances that are able to set on their legs again those that have fallen in epileptic fits, but cannot rid them of their disease. For although all other passions, even at the moment of their acme, do in some sort listen to reason and admit it into the soul, but anger does not. For as Melanthius says, fell things it does when it the mind unsettles. For it absolutely turns reason out of the doors and bolts it out. And like those persons who burn themselves and houses together, it makes all the interior of the body full of confusion and smoke and noise so that what would be advantageous can neither be seen nor heard. And so an empty ship in a storm at sea would sooner admit on board a pilot from without than a man in the tempest of rage and anger would listen to another's advice, 
unless his own reason was first prepared to hearken. But as those who expect a siege get together and store up supplies, when they despair of relief from without, so ought we by all means to succour the country far and wide to derive aids against our anger from philosophy and store them up in the soul. For when the time of need comes, we shall find it no easy task to import them. For either the soul doesn't hear what is said without because of the uproar, if it have not within it its own reason, like a botswain as it were, to receive at once and understand every exhortation. Or if it does hear, it despises what is uttered mildly and gently, while it is exasperated by harsh censor. For anger being haughty and self-willed and hard to be worked upon by another, like a fortified tyranny, must have someone born and bred with it to overthrow it. Now, long continued anger and frequent giving way to it produces an evil disposition of the soul, which people call irascibility, and which ends in passionateness, bitter bitterness, and peevishness. Whenever the mind becomes sore and vexed at trifles and querulous at everyday occurrences, like iron thin and beaten out too fine, but when the judgment checks and suppresses and wants the rising anger, it not only cures the soul for a moment, but restores its tone and balance for the future. It has happened to myself indeed two or three times now, when I strongly fought against anger, that I was in the same plight as the Thebans, who after they had at once defeated the Lacedaemonians, when they had hitherto thought invincible, never lost a battle against them again. I then felt confident that reason can win any victory. I saw also that my anger is not only appeased by the sprinkling of cold water, as Aristotle attested, but is also extinguished by the action of fear. I, as, as Homer tells us, anger has been cured and has melted away in the case of the many by some sudden joy. So that I came to the conclusion that this passion is not incurable for those who wish to be cured, for it does not arise from great and important causes, but banter and joking, a laugh or a nod, and similar trifles make many angry, as Helen, by addressing her niece, Electra, maiden now for a short time, provoked her to reply, Your wisdom blossoms late, since formerly you left your house in shame. And Callisthenes incensed Alexander by saying, when a huge cup was brought to him, I will not drink to Alexander until I shall require the help of Asclepius. As then it is easy to put out a flame kindled in the hair of hairs, and in the wicks of rubbish. But if it once gets a hold of things solid and thick, a flame quickly destroys and consumes them, raging amidst the lofty work of the carpenters, as Aeschylus said. So he that, he that observes anger in its rise, and sees it gradually smoking and bursting forth into a fire from some other chatty or rubbishly scrutiny, need have no trouble with it, but can frequently smother it merely by silence and contempt. For as a person puts out a fire by bringing no fuel to it, so with respect to our anger, he that does not in the beginning fan it, or stir up rage within himself, keeps off his anger and destroys it. And so, though Hieronymus has given us many useful sayings and precepts, I am not pleased with his remark that there is no perception of anger in its birth, but only in its actual development, so quick is it. For none of the passions, when stirred and set in motion, has so palpable a birth and growth as anger. As indeed, Homer skillfully shows us, when he represents Achilles as seized as one with grief, when word was brought to him of Patroclus' death, in the line, Thus spake he, and grief's dark cloud covered him. Whereas he represents him as waxing angry with Agamemnon slowly, and as inflamed by his many words, which if either of them, had abstained from their quarrel, would have not attained such growth and magnitude. And so, Socrates, so often as he has perceived any anger rising in him against any of his friends, setting himself, like some ocean promontory, to break the violence of the waves, would lower his voice and put on a smiling countenance, and give his eye a gentler expression, by inclining in the other direction, and running counter to his passion, thus keeping himself from fall and defeat. The first way... To overcome anger, my friend, like the putting down of some tyrant, is not to obey or listen to it when it bids you to speak loud and look fierce and beat yourself, but instead remain quiet 
and not to make the passion more intense as one would a disease by tossing about and crying out. In love affairs, indeed, such things as revelings and serenadings and crowding the loved one's door with garlands may indeed bring some pleasant and elegant relief. I went, but asked, not who or who she was, I merely kissed her doorpost. If that be a crime, I do plead guilty all the same. In the case of mourners, also giving up to weeping and wailing takes away with the tears much of the grief. But anger, on the contrary, is much more fueled and fanned by what angry people do and say. It is best, therefore, to be calm, or to flee and hide ourselves and go to a haven of quiet. When you feel the fit of temper coming upon you almost as an epileptic fit, that we fall not, or rather not fall onto others. For it is our friends that we fall upon most and most frequently. For we do not love all, nor envy all, nor fear all men. But nothing is untouched or unassailed by anger. For we are angry with friends and enemies alike, parents and children, aye, even with the gods and the beasts, and even things inanimate. As was Thamires, breaking his gold-bound horn, breaking the music of the well-compacted lyre. And Pandros, who called down a curse upon himself if he did not burn his brow after breaking it with his hands. And Xerxes inflicted stripes and blows to the sea and sent letters to Mount Athos. Divine Athos, whose top reaches the heavens, put not in the way of my works stones large enough and difficult to deal with, or else I will hew thee down and throw thee into the sea. For anger has many formidable aspects and many ridiculous ones. So of all the passions, it is the most hated and despised. It will be well to consider both aspects. To begin, then, whether my process was right or wrong, I know not, but I began my cure of anger by noticing its effects on others. As the Lacedaemonians study the nature of drunkenness in the helots. And in the first place, as Hippocrates tells us that disease is the most dangerous, in which the face of the patient is most unlike himself. So observing that people besides themselves anger change their face, their colour, their walk and their voice, I formed an impression, as it were, of that aspect of passion, and was very disgusted with myself, if I ever should appear so frightful, and like one out of his mind to my friends and wife and daughters.